I want to talk to us today about educators. We have heard from, about what our students need. You've heard from Linda. You've talked about, you've heard kids. But what does it mean for us in this space as educators to take on this work? And I want to talk about comfort and discomfort. So one thing I love about coming to this conference is it's in Napa. <laughs> and every year I'm like, oh my god, I get to go to Napa. You got to go wine tasting, perhaps. And you come in from this space, whether you're coming from DC, Virginia, Spain, Chile, you're coming to Napa. Super exciting and like, yes. And in the first couple of days you hear, you're like, wow. Linda Darling Hammond was on stage, American Ninja Warrior. Wow, what's happening with that? And then maybe yesterday you saw my friend Caleb talking about the work that he's doing with students. Or you saw the micro documentaries and you're thinking, I can't believe kids were able to do that. You're impressed. You're like, whoa, I can't believe the kids are making this stuff happen. But now, as you're moving into day three, you might have a different experience. You might be in this, uh-oh, <laughs> and oh no. <laughs> and I have to do what now? What happened to my pacing guide? Where is that going? How am I going to do this? On day three, going back home, schools are starting for some of you in just a couple weeks on the East Coast. And how are you going to do this? What does this process look like? What do you have to let go of? And what do you have to reimagine? And what are the things that you have to release from yourself as an educator to make all of this stuff happen for yourself? And I've been really lucky to have lots of different experiences in education. And through the high tech high, through my um, teaching down in the South Bay of San Diego, and then of course working with educators along the globe. And one thing that I have learned through my own work is that our deepest moments of struggle, the moments when we feel like we cannot go on, the moments when we feel as if we haven't figured this out, are actually our highest moments of learning. They are the moments when we've learned the most. The moment when you're crying because the kids did not get their homework in, that is the moment we learn the most. And so what I would thought I would talk today about is not just how great PBL, because I know it is, I want to talk about what is the struggle, the productive struggle that all of us need to go through alongside of our students in order to embrace the ambiguity of becoming a project-based teacher. And so, in design, we call this the design squiggle. It looks a lot like this. <laughs> it's this ever-flowing, abstract idea of how does this work up and down the peaks and the valleys within this. And we call this the squiggle. Sometimes we define it as this. It's the ambiguous, sometimes very messy, sometimes chaotic process of design where all of your assumptions about what you thought you knew have been challenged, have been disrupted. It's also the assumption about halfway through when you realize you actually had the wrong question to begin with, and you probably need to redesign that question. Or, but it's also the opportunity where you have the most maximum possibility for potential, and the ideas are boundless. It is the moment of ambiguity as you design your work. That's the design squiggle. And in learning at the D School, we spend a lot of time in this design squiggle space, designing experiences, working with educators. And what we've started to really narrow in more deeply is not just this up and down squiggle, but this idea of a learning journey. And how do we actually understand our peakest moments of learning coupled with our deepest emotional journey? What does that actually look like? Because we can talk about being having a hard experience, but it's not just hard. There's frustration. There's sadness, there's fear, there's exhilaration, there's happiness. How does that emotional journey that we all go through, that our students go through, and how do we understand them in conjunction with the learning that we're happening? So I've done this with my students, and I also did this for myself as a learner, and I'm going to show you my peak squiggle, my design squiggle for you, because um, mine started a long time ago. This is me. Yikes, uncomfortable. <laughs> this is, uh, I've never shown this picture publicly. Uh, it's the first time I've ever done this. I think it was on Facebook a long time ago, and I think I hid it on my Facebook profile. Um, but this is my eighth grade self. And for <laughs> some of you, um, I have a few friends in this room, but uh, 
some of you may not know, but when I was a young child, I really struggled in school. And it's not that I didn't like school, but I also, when I was a younger student, I had an auditory processing disorder, which means it was really hard for me to read. I struggled with language. I couldn't say my name. My name, I used to call my name Wawa because I couldn't pronounce my L's. My brother was Yamie instead of Jamie. My grunch was not a lunch. Um, and so when I went into elementary school, I struggled. I had pull out where I would sit for an hour or two with the workbooks, making sure I could learn how to read. But that whole experience, for those of you who've had that experience, the stigma, it made me feel stupid. I felt like I wasn't really smart enough. My friends were going out, having fun in PE, and I'm doing a workbook. And that took a lot of processing for me. And I remember in grade six, my English teacher had this opportunity. She had a moment. And in my school, we had an opportunity to take extended reading classes where you could take more reading, about two to three hours, for kids who were really struggling. Or I could take Spanish. And in some moment of exhilaration, inspiration, who knows what, she said, maybe Laura should take Spanish. And I did. And it was in that moment, the productive struggle of learning Spanish is where I actually learned English. I actually learned how English grammar functioned. I learned past preterite, conditional. I learned how sentences were formed. And I actually was pretty good at it. <laughs> I'm a Spanish speaker now. I have a minor in Spanish. I travel the country. I've given keynotes in Spanish. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Habla Espanol. Um, but I struggled, right? That doesn't mean it was easy the whole time. But that was my deepest learning moment because it transformed who I thought I was into something more, right? Those are the moments we're talking about. It was hard. It was struggling. I thought I couldn't do it. And it took me a long time to get my, my R's, right, to make that uh -uh. Yeah, you know that word. It took me a long time to figure that out. But that was my biggest learning. So when I became a teacher, I also found it was really hard, right? And for everybody who knows, when your first year of teaching is really challenging. And I remember my first day of teaching. I was teaching in the South Bay of San Diego. It's about 10 minutes from the border of Mexico. And I have students that cross the border every day to come to school. And like many of you who've been first year teachers in a big comprehensive high school, they do this really brilliant thing where they give first year teachers four different preps, <laughs> right? So. <laughs> And because I wasn't a traditional teacher, I came in in January. I was ready to go. And I was the fourth teacher my student had had that year. So by the time they got to me, they were like, well, when's she leaving? She's out. And I was teaching ESL. I was teaching English 9, English 11. And about halfway through the day, I closed my big door because, you know, it was a big comprehensive school. And I shut the door and I put my head on my desk, literally in tears. The kids don't like me, <laughs> and this is really hard. And I don't know why I signed up for this. <laughs> and in that moment, something happened. I had a knock on my door. My ninth grade student, her name was Catherine, knocked on my door and asked me if she could eat lunch with me. And she carried a trapper keeper just like this. <laughs> and I remember this trapper keeper. And that was one of the hardest days I've had teaching. But it was the, the biggest moment of learning because I realized what I was there for. It wasn't about the content. It wasn't about my design. It wasn't about my delivery. It was about showing up for these kids every single day. That moment, that depth of sadness was equaled by the exhilaration and the learning that I realized that it was about these students and that's what I needed to do. Right? That's it. So, I taught there for a number of years. It was a great experience. Um, and then this wild school opened in San Diego called High Tech High. And so I was like, well, I'm going to give that a go. Um, and I was excited. And if you saw from Caleb's students, it's a pretty overwhelming place. <laughs> There's a lot of projects. People are doing great things. And I had this experience that I can't do PVL. I have no idea what it is. I had ideas about projects. I used to do dessert projects. I had ideas about that. 
And in my first year, we had exhibitions. And I remember my first exhibition. And I had a lot of different ideas to do. I had books and things like that. So by the time we got there, I had hovercrafts. I was like, yes, we have hovercrafts. I'm going to put those in display. And then we had books. So we had redesigned books. We had vignettes. We had Red House on Mango Street. And we had all these great books that I had displayed. And we had documentaries, because I'm like, we got to do documentaries. Let's get all those going. So I had all this going on on my exhibition, and the students were running it, and I had an MC, and they had food, and I was like, yeah, I got this. I was really excited. And then I walked out of my exhibition, because my students were running it. And so I walked down the hall, across the way to another school, and I walked down to a hallway. And one of the fellow teachers at that time had turned the hallway into a bunker for World War II. Students had learned French. They had built a submarine. <laughs> they had built a cave. <laughs> and I looked around, and I was like, I've done nothing this semester. <laughs> How did I? I didn't teach them French in six months. And I had this moment where I walked back to my classroom, to my partner teacher, and I was in tears. I was like, what did we do? Did you just see what they did? And in that moment, same experience. I had this moment of learning. Because I realized that the learning was the exhibition, right? I can't skip this. That was the powerful piece. But what I also learned is that the highest quality of work for my exhibition is the baseline for my next level of work. I saw that great work, and I was overwhelmed. I was like, I don't know how to build a submarine. <laughs> But I'm gonna to aspire to that. I'm gonna make that quality of work my aspiration, and I'm gonna keep going, right? Because I know the first time I did it was not gonna be great. Just like many of you who've never done an exhibition, I'm gonna give you a spoiler alert. It may not go well the first time. <laughs> um, but they really matter. They matter for your kids because they are the big game night, they are the audience, it makes the learning real and powerful and it gives them purpose. So you can't skip the exhibition. It is the joy, it's the celebration, it is when they feel that exhilaration and they have their deepest moment of learning, right? They get to go through that entire emotional journey with you. So, exhibitions. <laughs> um, and then I was lucky enough to become a principal. I don't know if lucky is the right word for that. Um, <laughs> I had a lot of wonderful parents that I dealt with over the years. Um, and there was a lot of moments of, of joy and exhilaration of hiring and, and releasing teachers and starting professional development, all these wonderful things. Um, and in those spaces, I learned a lot of different things. Um, but probably the most important was how do I release space? How do I give my teachers the time and purpose to actually find the joy in teaching? How did I give them time to work together? How did I remove myself from what I would call power and privilege and positionality and release my own leadership so that they can step up? And I think probably the most important, which was challenging for all of us who are working really hard, is how did I release the burden on my teachers and on myself for doing it right the first time? How do I release them from perfection? Knowing that that is going to be really challenging. So how did I make sure that they can forgive themselves for not making their exhibition first, the perfect the first time, right? Um, and a couple things we also learned, of course, is like, say yes. <laughs> you have to say yes. Caleb, you saw yesterday, one of the favorite things I saw about him, and I've known him for a while, is whenever a teacher comes up to him, his first response is yes. Right? So I practice the same thing. Whenever a teacher would come to me and say, I have this idea, I'm like, yes. <laughs> when a student comes up to me, I have an idea, yes. Right? this idea of releasing burden and actually giving trust away is the lesson we all think. And again, for that, that's the, that is the peak in the valley because it's scary to say yes. 
because you have no idea what's going to (laughs) happen. But you're rewarded by the projects and the stuff that comes back to you. But, you know, as I know, as some of you heard, I work at the D School, and we also think about yes and. (laughs) This is an idea of improv. And I want to give another spoiler that many of you are in this space thinking about projects that you're doing. And we like to call these ideas prototypes. (laughs) They're not perfect. Many of you have strategic plans in this space about how you're going to take this and implement it back in your school. And another spoiler here is that this is a prototype. (laughs) You haven't figured it out yet, and that's okay. We use, we use post-its because we want the ideas to be scrappy. We want to ideate on them. We want to actually share them with others before they get out there. So when you think about yourself a leader, release yourself from the burden that your project, that your strategic plan is perfect right now. It may not be, and it doesn't have to be, right? It's a prototype. And when you go back and you share it with people, and someone gives you feedback, you can say, yes, and. What else? What else? How do I make this even better? So I've been a teacher, a principal. And then, as Brandon was saying, I was fortunate enough when the High Tech High Graduate School came aboard to kind of work with leaders all over the country. Um, And (laughs) leading change. And that meant running a deeper learning conference. That meant working with schools in Virginia and in Chile. And I was grounded constantly with this highs and lows about some questions like, how do I help teachers? How do I do this? I didn't know. How do we help more kids? How do we make sure that the kids who are furthest from opportunity are having the experience that they desire and need so much for the world that we're living in? How do we do this more? And then the bigger question, is this work good? Is it good enough? I was rattled by these questions all the time when I would go into schools and talk with educators and have this seeking suspicion that we haven't figured it out. Um, And in this process, we felt like we learned a couple things. And one is this idea of we got to show the work. If you're doing the work and you're supporting the work, you have to show the work. And there is this theory, and many schools that have done exhibitions, you'll see is the question I always ask is, where does work live when it's done? By the end of this conference, there's about 1,300 people here, right? So there'll be 1,300 projects that will get done, that will get created. Where do they live? How do they show themselves? Where do they live in the school? on your websites, and in your buildings to show the work that people have created. Um, For those of you who are long fans of Ted Sizer, he often says you can tell a whole lot by what a school values by how it values people, place, and resources. And I have a caveat to that, is that I think you can actually tell a whole lot by what a school values by what it places on the walls. A long time ago, I think I wrote a blog post about Who's speaking through the walls? Is it the voices of teachers? Is it the voices of students? Is it the voices of a publisher? (laughs) Um, Who is speaking when you walk through your school? When you think about your classroom right now, what voice is being heard on the walls? And so I've been lucky to think about a lot of teachers around the country and on the world who are thinking about how do they make this transparent so that people see the pedagogical values of the school as soon as they walk in, right? They want it to be displayed, they want it to be visual. So in Australia, you see this is an Art Deco project that covered a classroom wall because this teacher was inspired by this. A different teacher decided to take all these, I think these are pilings or big movements, and turn it into a a geometry project covered every single, I think, support structure within the hallways into a geometry project. When this was done, they realized it wasn't enough and took all of the big tables and did geometry on top of those so that every classroom had a geometry when you walked in. It's transparent in the spaces that they provided. Another friend of mine (laughs) walked around their school in Chile. Their friends are here from Nido de Aguila School. 
they decided to transform their open space to how the voices of the students speak to them. Inspirational thoughts. Anywhere you walked into this school, you would find crevices and caveats of student work just when students were walking around. Created by kids for kids. In Spain, the nuns did another step further. Not only did they show the work, but they have a process board. This is their wonderings about project-based learning, their questions, their theories about what this might be. In Georgia, people are transforming their walls and making them into a history timeline. In Virginia, our friends are thinking about how do students become experts in showcasing this. In Chicago, my friends at Shy Tech were taking walls and transforming them into a music organ that students interact with and they're walking through the building. What I love about this project even now is you see young students who are not, who didn't do this project, playing the organ and learning how sound waves operate. In Kentucky, they transform the opening space to a rotating canvas where people can display work constantly. So when they're thinking about this work, where does the work live when it's done? How do you use the space in your school to show not just the best work, but all the work that students are creating? Not the perfect work, but the imperfect work that shows what your school values around the visions that you're creating with your kids. This is what you see. You see happiness, right? And you see the work that comes through. So my journey's not over and my talk is just about over, um, is that I'm not quite done yet. I work now at the Stanford Design School, and I've been in about six or seven months, and I still don't know quite what we're doing. <laughs> um, we're still figuring it out. But one thing's for sure is that we're going to have these peaks and valleys. I know a little bit about this design process, probably more than I think, about how do you empathize and define and think about how do we test ideas. But even deeply, one thing that we've learned is that we like to be, consider ourselves, we call human-centered designers. How do we design projects in collaboration with other human beings, and what does that look like? And when I started thinking about this talk and what's happening in the world, I've kind of argued that this is not enough yet. We really want to be humanitarian-centered designers. What are the challenges that are facing our planet and our nation, and how do we design those projects alongside and in collaboration with the communities that we are working with. That's the work we want to be doing. That is the real work that Caleb talked about yesterday. Those are the projects, and there's a, there are a bazillion of them in every single community, and how do we find them? For me right now, I'm thinking about inclusivity, right? How do we design for people who are left out of the system? What does that look like? How do we design for machine learning and AI? I live in Silicon Valley, so there are like robots running around, and I'm curious about that. But in particular, I'm curious about what is the intersection of machine learning and equity, and who is designing this work, and for whom? We want to know. I'm also thinking about sustainability. These are questions that are facing our planet, and what, how do our students design this? with this idea that everything can be, that everything that was designed can be redesigned. We know inequity was systemically designed and it can be redesigned. And everyone in this space are becoming project-based learning designers. So we can design classrooms. We can change the way desks are set up every day. You can remove all of your desks in August and have the students design the classroom. We can do that. We can design school culture. We can change behaviors, we can design the walls, we can change the behaviors and the mindsets of how we operate in school, we can design that. We can also design assessment. My friends who might have been to South by Southwest, we created a, a puzzle bus inside of an old 1970, 1996 Frito-Lay truck and turned it into an escape room to look at how do we really look at assessment. Not only was it crazy and wild, but it asked the question of what does assessment really look like in group work? We can design these things. They're all projects. And lastly, we can really design how we learn alongside and with students. We have a challenge called Shadow a Student, which is shadowing a student for a day. It's an empathy challenge. It's an equity challenge. But it's a design challenge as well, is what do students actually go through when they go through your school? All of these things can be designed and redesigned with the purpose of equity. So I'm just about out of time. Um, 
and this has been my journey, and it's not done yet. And as a designer, I do things with my students. So this, this past spring, is my student's journey. I taught a class this past year on designing equitable educational ecosystems, and my students track their journey just like this, and you'll see, I'm not so great. This project was great. And also, our idea was not so great the first time. <laughs> All of us go through this journey. You will go through this journey, and your students are going to go through this journey. And so I want to close with this question of what your journey is going to be. What is going to be the peaks that you'll have, and what is going to be the emotional lows and highs that you're going to go through as you embark on this work? What's this design squiggle going to look like for you? Because it will be a squiggle. It won't be a linear progression. And how are you going to embrace that and celebrate that and support yourselves in those places? And what's the purpose that's going to sustain you? My purpose has always been thinking about students, being an advocate for them, and thinking about social justice and equity. But what's your purpose? So do I have like two minutes, Bob? All right. So as a practice person, I'm really interested in reflection. So I'm going to give you two minutes <laughs> to turn to somebody next to you, and I want you to think about your last two days. Has there been a moment where you've learned something pretty deep that challenged your thinking, and what was your emotional response to it? So think about the last two days what, where was a moment that you learned something pretty profound, challenging, disruptive, and how did you emotionally respond to it? How did it make you feel? Start now. Turn to somebody next to you. <laughs> Thank you, my friends in the back. The teacher move. <laughs> I was a middle school principal, so I do know how to do the clap once, but we won't do that. Um, <laughs> this is your journey. It's starting right now at, at PBL World as you go back. Um, at the D school, we talk about a bias toward action, a bias toward prototyping. Start now. And I also think we need to re, it's a yes and, is that we also need to have a bias toward reflection because it is the metacognition of the moments that actually make the learning palpable, and that's why you remember them. And so as you kind of close up and you think about where you're going to go, I want to close with this final quote from Maxine Green. Um, and I'll read it for you for those in the back. It's hard to read. But she says, for me, and I'm, and I'm sure for most of you, to be human is to be always in the process of becoming, to be in quest of openings, of possibilities, always. We are always becoming something. Our students are on a journey and a trajectory, and everyone in this room is on a journey to become something different than when they already showed up. You've learned something. You're all project-based learning teachers. You're in the process of becoming a new type of teacher, a different type of teacher. And so my closing words to you is these, you are becoming something different. And how are you going to continue to celebrate yourself honoring those peaks and those valleys that you're going to go through, and then empathizing with your students who are going through the exact same thing. Everything that you learn and the moments that you've had, they're experiencing them just now. Every single day when they show up to school, they are in constant flow of that design squiggle. And so how do you actually share your learning, your struggles with them, that's what it means to be a project-based teacher. It means giving up and relinquishing control, but also sharing your fears and your struggles alongside of your students so that you can actually grow together. So thank you, and that's it. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.
Thanks, buddy. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> ah, thanks. I'll give that. Ah, oh, thanks.